yeah, the Christian faith is massive. Explore it. Like, explore it. You know, look into the other rooms. You don't have to agree with them, but understand that that that, that the particular thread you're in is is really a I would argue now a fringe thread, yeah. right? That is not reciprocated by the majority of Christians, whether they're Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, even mainline yeah. Protestant. So yeah. please, if you're if you take your faith seriously, go from is it right or wrong to explore. Just yep. explore the different perspectives out there. Yep. That, I think that 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 will be a great pers- a great place to start. Hi, my name is Leo WT, and you have found your way to the Conversations Podcast. Conversations exist to create spiritually minded conversations about life. We desire to create safe space for dialogue and community. We desire to come together regularly and intentionally to generate conversations about life, belief, and the intersection of the two. Everyone is welcome at the conversation. What is up, friends? It is Leo WT, and I'm here with another episode of Conversations Official. If you haven't been here before, welcome. I'm a little weird. I invite weird people on. Usually they're tattooed and they have sassy things to say about like white supremacy or the church. And I, I, I managed to just hook a real ringer today. So, uh, but before we dive into that, I just want you folks to know that the single most important part about conversations is that we come together regularly and intentionally to have spiritually minded conversations about life, belief, and the intersection of the two. And the absolute, absolute non-negotiable of this conversation is that everybody's voice matters in the conversation. And so if you're new here, if you have comments, if you have thoughts, if you have questions, please get at me. Um, I, I really enjoy the fact that conversation in general is spontaneous, right? And it's an ebb and a flow between my guests and myself and between uh, the community and myself. So hit me up. You know what I mean? Now, I have a a friend on today and I'm going to let him introduce himself in a moment, but we were talking about having kids right before we hit record. And so, you know, I have this story about my youngest kid. My youngest child is 13 and I have five children and I've never not had a 13 year old. So I've been through plenty of emo phases, right? With my kids. But the best part about my son is this. Um, you, you can see myself here. I've got like a shirt on that I made that says, don't pray for me. I'm tattooed, right? I'm, I'm sassy. I'm queer, all of these things. And my wife is even more so, right? So when we are your parents, right? What is your emo phase? My son's emo phase was actually farm emo. And he, in fact, decided to become an alt-right conservative Christian for a while. And so that was my son in a nutshell. Now, thankfully, we're nosing up out of that a little bit. Um, But my son, my son's emo phase was a folk music listening, Stetson wearing alt-right Trump supporting conservative Christian phase. That hand on the Bible, you can take it to the bank. I will send you a picture. But in all of this, I realized, holy shit, we have got to do better for our kids, right? And we have to point out the ways in which what we see in popular discourse is not at all like actual Christianity. And that brings me to our guest, my friend, Tim. And I'm going to let him introduce himself and what we're here to talk about today a little bit. I mean, how do I introduce myself after that story? I don't know. Good luck. Godspeed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know your shirt says don't pray for you, but honestly, how can I not? <laughs> you might need to, right? <laughs> well, damn. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much for having me on, <clears throat> Leo. I appreciate it. And to everyone listening, if you hear me coughing throughout this, I, I just tested positive for COVID today. So okay. it's, a, it's a great day in my household. Oh, wait, um, I feel- it's real? It's not a conspiracy? No, no. COVID either actually or, exists. Well, it's either that or it could be a government like like chip thing. You know, maybe oh, like there's okay. some microbots inside of who knows, right? Um, <laughs> I did go to the doctor the other day, so maybe that's what happened. They injected. They might have put something. it right in there. <laughs> but yeah, my name is Tim Whitaker. I am the creator of the New Evangelicals, and um, we're here to talk about Christian nationalism and all of the layers to that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I. I mean, I'm passionate about a lot of things in the Christian tradition, but this is one of the biggest ones for me. And probably, even though I'm not an expert, I don't have my PhD in anything, let alone in Christian nationalism, I'm, I'm, probably, the, I'm probably the most well-read personally on this subject and, and feel the most comfortable speaking about it. So thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. I, that's why that's why I personally wanted to bring you on. And I've, I've said this before, uh, but in case anybody hasn't, hasn't seen me or isn't super familiar with my platform, 
I acknowledge that I come from a privileged space, right? Um, not in all the ways, but in a lot of the ways. I'm white. I was born into um, a Christian family. Mm. I had a lot of access to, to both my parents when I was younger and extended family. Um, so I know I'm an English as a first language speaker. I'm able bodied. There are a lot of intersections in which I have privilege. And so I want to start off this conversation by acknowledging those. Now, the flip side of that conversation is I came out as a lesbian between my third and fourth years of pastoral ministry uh, degree wow. study at a conservative evangelical college and coming out made me suddenly realize that there was an other and i know that that is an incredibly privileged thing to say but right. i'm here because i can't speak about being a black person in america i can't speak about being a muslim in america but what i can speak about although i'm queer and the church has been trying to abort me for years you know mm. um, i can speak about a person who grew up in the privilege of white american christianity um, so that's why I think it's important that, uh, and that's why I wanted to invite you on Tim, because I, I've heard, I've listened to the, your podcast and I know that you have this background and I feel like it's very important not to speak over marginalized voices, but it is important to speak in the spheres where we know what we're talking about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I was just talking to someone that I, I interviewed on my own podcast earlier today. And what I told them was that I see a lot of the work that I doing now as my way of repenting. Mm hmm right it's yes. my way of saying wow unintentionally ignorantly i was complicit in these systems yep. i'm no longer as ignorant i still have a long way to go of course right and right. and part of my work now is you know repenting from what i helped build to help now dismantle the harmful elements of that uh, so that that has helped me yeah and i feel like a lot of times sometimes the conversation about racism and even when we move into christian and nationalism the problem is we don't have a great uh, there's no word that's like pre-racism and everybody, as soon as you throw out the hard R word, white people shut down. But what they don't realize is like a lot of racists aren't bad people. A lot of racists are simply complicit in racist, racist systems. And so people shut down. But I think it's really important, especially in the sphere of Christianity, that we talk about white supremacy. We talk about race and we talk about Christian nationalism. How yeah. How did you get like... How did you get, what was that moment where you're like, uh-oh, something's wrong? Like, was there a fracture moment? Because for me, it was coming out. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, for your listeners out there, I am um, a white, um, able-bodied male. Um, I'm married with, with, with two kids to a great wife. And, and so I really have all of the checkboxes for most privileged type of person in America to exist. Mm -hmm. um, never been fearful of getting pulled over by the cops, right? Never, never, never thought about... Oh, a, a mass shooting. Wow, mm -hmm. that, that person was going after someone who looks like me, right? Never had those moments. Mm -hmm. um, and was always kind of, the system was designed for me to, to flourish, to flourish. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, of course, you don't really know those things. You, you don't have any categories for that yet. So I'm growing up in, in a fundamentalist space. I'm homeschooled for nine years. My parents are lovely people, hard workers. My dad is incredibly generous. They, they've, they've helped pay people's mortgages when they're in need, no questions asked. I mean, very, you know, I, I, in that sense, it's the, these things are always complicated, always nuanced. And, and I watched my parents, you know, raise me and my siblings really well and always be there for us. So like you said, a lot of privilege there. Mm -hmm. And I, I've always been devoted to Jesus. I mean, I, and I still am. I still am. The, the work I do is out of my devotion on wanting and wanting to follow Jesus as, as best as I can learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. So I say all that because I want people, people to understand that, you know, I was really the golden, I was one of the golden boys. My wife mm -hmm. and I waited to have sex. We were married. I played, I served actively in the church. I volunteered. I've helped plant churches. I've, I've, you name it. I've done it. I'm, I'm one of those, right? Yep. As Paul says, you know, out of all the Jewish people, he was the Jew of Jews. Well, yep. I, I was one of the evangelicals of evangelicals. <laughs> you know, I have my Awana vest. I, you name it. I've done it. Yep. All right, I, I can I, I can go there, and we definitely can later on if you want. So anyway, <laughs> um, for me, there were a couple of big shifts that happened to me, and I'll, for sake of time, I'll just kind of condense them. One was yeah. I I was part of a, a really um, genuine community group of people in like our, our early, late teens, early twenties, um, that really shaped how I began to think about what church is. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I kind of got into this like I just want the true gospel, almost like this real reformed, you know, right. Paul Washer, you know, John Piper kind of vibe. Right. But I, but I'm also reading Rob Bell at the same time. Like, wow, Rob Velvet Elvis, this is really you know. And in my head, I'm trying to merge the two, or just trying to understand the perspectives. Mm -hmm. I have no categories for what I'm reading yet. I don't understand that Rob Bell is more progressive, for lack of a better term, and right. John Piper is a straight up reformed 
you know, legend in his circles, right? Yep. So I'm just reading them in a vacuum. Oh. And so from there, yeah, yeah, but honestly did shape me. You know, I, I can't yeah. lie about that, right? And it True. definitely, I think, gave me a sense of like, I, I just want to, I want to have integrity in whatever and in, in how I follow Jesus, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now at this point, again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a product of my environment. I'm not queer affirming. I'm 22. But I started to realize even then, like, hmm, the way we're treating queer people, man, I'm not saying I'm affirming yet, but like something doesn't seem right, right? I mean, that, that was kind of the trajectory that I was on. Yeah. And I've had, I've had, I have some, it's funny because I have some great queer friends who were there with me during those times mm -hmm. who would, were so they didn't have to be but they were gentle and patient and honestly mm -hmm. it makes me even tear up because their stories um is really what, what started shifting how mm -hmm. i viewed that community it was really love that 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 won me over right it wasn't yeah. hey you're a bigoted asshole it was hey tim i know that you mean well but we right. should talk about this right so anyway, so long story short, what really was the, the straw that broke the camel's back? So again, this is all layered, right? All these little things, all these little cracks are happening, but no mm -hmm. categories, no right. awareness of, of what's behind all this. Right. And then when Trump happened, which is just a very common example, a lot of people who are in this, what I call deconstruction explosion, yep. right? This was a, a big moment. That was a moment where I said, oh my God, so yep. I don't know what yet. I don't have terms white supremacy or colonization, but something in my tradition is way wrong. And the example I always used was when I had people who raised me as a kid, giving mm -hmm. me that sexual purity talk, right, Tim? Mm -hmm. Sex is between one man and one woman. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, you don't look at pornography. Uh, right. You don't do these things, right? And then they're telling me, oh, Tim, you should vote for the guy on the cover of Playboy on his third marriage. This is a good Christian candidate. When that moment happened, I said, I, I'm not, there. I can't believe you don't see the disconnect here, right? And that was the beginning, and the language I have for it now that actually um, constitutional lawyer Andrew Silo gave me was, um, he said, essentially what I realized was that I assumed that by having the, the same beliefs as my group, we share mm -hmm. the same values, mm -hmm. and clearly we didn't, mm -hmm. right? And that was a moment where I go, whoa, there's a major shift here. And then yeah. from there, 2016 through 2020, COVID, of course, the lynching yeah. of Maude Arbery, the yep. murder of George Floyd, murder of Breonna Taylor, et cetera. Yep. All those moments made me go, I don't have words yet, but something is fucked up yeah. in my evangelical spaces. And when I'm watching pastors, I don't know if it's the theology. I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. Something is way wrong. So that, that's what led me to even starting new evangelicals. And yeah. from there, I've been on a journey just kind of exploring you know different yeah. parts of the christian tradition that, that's the long and short of it and i love i love that you are so vulnerable as to document that too because i feel like like i said with racism like once you drop the hard r word a lot of people are out right but the reality is is we're all on a journey i didn't just plop here um and become who i was to be honest it was actually in the safety of of a black and brown community of faith in harlem that i was able to come out and they mm. provided me with not only the space to come out but also the language to begin to understand systemic racism and right. marginalization and advocacy and all of these things. And so we don't just arrive, right? And I think it's really right. important to model the journey. And I love that you've done that. Um, I, and I, I do wanna... think really, really sorry, yeah, I, I add just one thing to that, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, go for I, it. You know, I think one of the problems that I am realizing is that we forget that. And we're, mm -hmm. and now we're, we can be naturally very cool to people who were, were where we were a couple of years ago, and mm -hmm. we don't give them that same path forward instead we just yeah. say well you're a bigoted you're racist especially with, with how social media has inflamed the conversation right and i have to fight that myself to be frank with you you know yeah but that remembering my own story and you know kind of like how again how scripture says you know when when, when, when you were on the out christ brought yeah. you in so yeah. be merciful to other people that that thought you know is is still very true to me absolutely and i love that I, let's let's take that tone and, and ride it through the conversation because um, there are a lot of people that I understand, my own family not being the least of which, that do not understand who I am. And now the great yeah. irony of who I am right now is that the further I went to the gospel, the more I became this person, right? Um, <laughs> but also, Which I, I love also, the aesthetic, by the way. I'm jealous of the whole look. I am. I love the <laughs> tattoos, the finger tattoos. I mean, I want it all. So We love to see it. Actually, my finger tattoos are biblical, Greek, and Hebrew.
Hebrew because I had to read them in college. So, so had good. to take so it, make it metal, you know. <laughs> uh, but I would I would love to have a conversation for for people who actually want to understand. Um, yes. Let's say let's say we're ta- our ideal audience right now is someone who doesn't understand how Christianity and its American white interpretation has brought us to to a presidency like Donald Trump and the vitriol that we have absolutely seen on least on this country since like if you had to start how would you begin to to explain this conversation in a way that might make sense to someone who's still stuck in the system sure well first i want to just say that that everything i'm going to say is not my own thought these are other people's works i want to shout out three people that really help shift and shape how i see things the first one is the book unsettling truths by mark charles and soon Cha ra uh, about the Doctrine of Discovery, which we'll talk about in a minute. Mm-hmm. The other book that's really important to, that I think is a good read is the book called The Bible Told Them So by J. Russell Hawkins that documents how Southern evangelicals in the 50s through the 70s really fought hard to preserve segregation and not towards desegregation. And the third book, which is maybe a little overused these days, but it's a, it's, it's a reason it's overused, is uh, Jesus and John Wayne by Kristen Dume. Oh um, my God, you know, so the, good. You read those three books and you're going to have, you're going to start seeing some pictures mm-hmm. along with the color of compromise by Jamar Tisby. We'll throw that one in there too. Mm-hmm. You read those four books and you're going to start, you're going to start seeing things a little bit differently because yep. one of the things you have to remember is that nothing happens in a vacuum. Our right. culture, especially white culture. And when I say that, by the way, I don't mean every single white person, but right. there is a culture. Okay. That everyone has. And I, I've been a part of one and my culture as a white person in America taught me that like, you're not really connected that far back. There isn't the ripples aren't that aren't that far out, maybe Mm -hmm. 10, 15 years ago. But Mm -hmm. but to get to to understand Trump, you have to go back a long, long way. I mean, you know, quite literally back to the founding of the country in a lot of ways. And and but but for our sake, for our conversation, I think it's good to pick up from really the 60s and 70s, Mm -hmm. because that's where you have uh, Jerry Falwell. Uh, He's the founder of the religious right and the moral majority. You have Bob Jones. And until you understand why they started their movement, you will not understand how Trump happened. Yeah. So I, yeah. I think I think we should start there. Yeah, let's do it. Let's go for it. Um, we've had I've had Kristen and Mark Charles both on the podcast before. Same. So I love I love hearing that. Um I was actually put on a uh heretic like bingo card with mark charles this week and i was like shit i have done something right you know what i mean i i i aimed to be on that card so congratulations my friend congratulations, <laughs> i mean it's Leo. it's only been 16 years that i've been working on ordination <laughs> i would have been ordained 12 years ago if i was cisgendered and straight so i'm glad well, i've just well. finally now <laughs> achieved heretic status but yeah let's right. let's start off because on this podcast we haven't talked a ton about jerry falwell or bob jones and i would love to bring that into the the conversation we're having yeah so it's really important and again i'm, I'm going to speak in generalities here we're not going to mm-hmm. talk a whole lot about the queer community in this story because all yeah. oh, that's a big part of it this is going kind of this is kind of the foundation of even that absolutely so essentially what you have to understand is that jerry falwell um southern baptist you know good christian man he was really not, not that political in the beginning mm-hmm. um and really neither was bob jones in fact most evangelicals were kind of like <laughs> eh, whatever politics i mean for example when roe v wade happened Yep. The, the SBC as an institution affirmed it. They yes, affirmed Roe v. Wade for, for actually almost a decade after. You can read every single iteration of it on their website. It, you'll yep. see how they how they start progressing more towards that, what we now know. Mm-hmm. So you have to understand that like that, 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 that it's not like Christians were always this way. Okay. Mm-hmm. The circles we're swimming in come from somewhere. But where do they come from? A mm-hmm. lot of people are under the impression that that the moral majority, which is what Jerry Falwell and another person named Paul Weirich, what mm-hmm. they started was really over abortion. Yep. But that is not true. That is mythology. The main foundation, and you can look up the sermons. There's a sermon by Jerry Falwell that says, uh, I, forgot the, I forgot the title, but essentially it, it, it's Brown v. Board, you know, which, like, like, like choose a side. And mm-hmm. he says in the sermon that if the justices knew God's law, they would never allow the idea of desegregation to happen in the U.S. when it came to school integration. So Jerry Falwell, That's I hate horrifying. to say it, it, of course it's horrifying. You know, he was racist. I mean, he and not just like, oh, I, I'm in the culture, I don't know better. I mean, he was actively fighting against Black <coughs> Black America being integrated yeah. with white America. Yeah. And so anyway, so so that happens. And, and all of a sudden now what happens is Bob Jones, this is very important. Bob Jones starts Bob Jones University, very mm-hmm. well-known college in the circles that we swim in. And, mm-hmm. and over time, the IRS says, listen, you're because you will not allow 
um, black students to attend your school, you are in violation now of the constitution, really, right? And, and, and of the Supreme Court. And we're yeah. going to take away your tax exempt status. Yeah. And Bob Jones starts the idea of, well, no, 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 religious freedom. I have, re this is a religious issue. Mm -hmm. So we have to, and, and if you, shameless plug, but if you go to our Instagram and go to our highlights and look up, and look up the highlight Christian schools, we yeah. document how, how even the private school industry launched from schools becoming integrated, okay? Yeah. Especially in the South, there's a, a massive jump. In fact, today, they're still largely segregated. That's yeah. the reality. So anyway, so I know it's a little long-winded, but we have to, that's so important to recognize. And yeah. as, as, as this blatant language of, you know, the racist, the racist should stay separate happened, mm -hmm. it became out of vogue. You know, eventually culture's like, eh, I don't know. We should right. think this, right? But, but conservative evangelicals in particular were like, no, this is, God's decreed law. In fact, I would argue if you look up, you can look up a, a Bob Jones sermon word for word. If you if you if you interchange black for queer, you have the same exact argument today. Mm. Okay, Bob Jones is there. The Bible's clear. This is God's word. The race should stay separate. Here's my verse proving it. I mean, it's the same. It's the same scaffolding that we yep. inherit today. Yep. So that's where all this comes from. Okay. Yeah. And so, am I good so far? Should I keep going? Wanna, yeah, wanna... no, go for it. I'm loving right, it because this right. isn't this is an area I haven't read up on, so I'm I'm excited to hear about it. Sure. And by the way, all the sources I I gave at the at the beginning document some form of this, so yeah. I'm not just making it up for for your audience to know. <laughs> um, but it's important to understand that that the moral majority was not founded primarily over abortion. That became a a, a more important topic because it's easier to sell. It's right. murder. We're killing children. Oh, right. how could we do that as Christians? Right. Yeah. Right. So that became easier, and that really picked up in the 80s. But before that, it was all about segregation, all yeah. about keeping the races separate. Yep. So that's the underpinning of what forms the moral majority. And yeah. from there, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm really condensing things, but that's where you get things like, like satanic panic, yep. right? Now these Christians who are really getting political for the first time yep. in, in really a different way, you have some, some hints back in the 1920s with like you know the evol the, the the evolution debate for sure but, yeah. but they got their asses kicked so they're kind right. of in shame there right right so now here comes jerry falwell and he's an evangelical not a fundamentalist there's a big mm -hmm. difference yeah. but him forming the moral majority is what brings fundamentalism back in to evangelicalism yeah. and that's where you start seeing a lot of the rhetoric of you know um god's word is clear we have to yeah. we have to change society for you know in order to be a more christian nation a lot of this yeah. rhetoric takes off in the 80s and 90s they get yeah. in bed with with with, with, with right-wing politics that's where you get ronald reagan ronald mm -hmm. reagan ronald ronald reagan <laughs> was br brilliant this guy. he knew exactly who he was courting because yep. a lot of a lot of evangelicals vote a Democrat very often. Yep. Um, so it was a big shift to have this swing. So again, people think, oh, Christians have always been this way. No, no, there was a big shift that happened in the 70s and 80s. Yep. And so that that essentially laid the groundwork on a theological level. That's where you have the evangelical industry. This is what Christian Dubay talks about, right? The, yep. the evangelical term is exploding. Churches are growing. People are, are leaving the uh, Catholic and mainline uh, Protestant religions because they went yep. more casual. And so yep. there's a lot of pieces in this too that really allow evangelicalism, especially conservative evangelicalism, to explode and become a very powerful voting bloc. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. So and that, that's, that's, that's some of the foundation. That's absolutely how we get to Christian nationalism, because there's a conflation of politics with Christian values. And I think part of what makes that the perfect storm is the myth of um, America being a Christian nation, the ways in which in our very constitution, um, segregation is structured. Uh, we have, you know, we have Amer Native, ugh, Native Americans being merciless savages, which is a, a literary device that has not yet been corrected. Absolutely. We have African Americans being three fifths of a person, right? And we have all of this baked into America. And That's then... Exactly right. And then the church and politics start holding hands. And it's funny that you mentioned the 50s, 60s, 70s, because there was also, I just did a research paper on this. In 1946 and 1948, um, sex uh, human biologist, right? Alfred Kinsey, who does a sex study. And it's the first widespread study on human sexuality. And so he releases human sex, uh, sexuality of a human male and sexuality of a human female, right as we're starting to see this sort of 
resurgence, right, of, of uh, evangelicalism, abortion issues, voting blocks, all of these things happening in the mid-century there. And you start to see these groups systemically be marginalized by right, right. white American alt-right Christianity. And all of that is in the sauce, like you said. Yeah, and, and don't forget, too, there is definitely an element of, for right or for wrong, this is not maybe factually correct, but a feeling for a lot of white Christians, especially more racist ones, who were like, whoa, civil rights got passed, you know, it, it, it's getting more steam, now we kind of feel othered, right? Now we feel like, like we're losing what's ours. And that's yep. why I said, you really have to go back to the founding of the country to understand how embedded these systems are, but for our conversation, for Christian nationalism, it really yep. starts to get embedded uh, more so maybe than ever um, in, in, in these circles. I also want to say one more thing Leo, and feel yeah. free to, I would love your thoughts on this, but I'm careful these days to, to make it, to, to say things like um, the problem is that Christians got political. I think that Christians are called to be political. I think though the problem is how they're getting political. And I think that Christian nationalism as it's, as it's currently manifested, and there's still some history, we have to, talk, we have to get into talk radio and the right-wing yes. pundits. There's a whole different element here that we'll dive into. Yeah. Um, but, but it's not so much that as a Christian, I want to advocate for things for all of my neighbors, right? That promote human flourishing, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's queer rights or affordable health care, livable wages, but it's about how Christian nationalism advocates for policies at the expense of everyone else. Because there's this deep-seated belief that America is a Christian nation and yep. any force that, that, that maybe quote unquote secularizes it is therefore a demonic force trying to take away God's blessing. That's why Jerry Falwell in 2001 blamed 9-11 on yep. the queer community, on the yep. people having abortions, and on the feminists. I mean, this is this is you can look up the the video; it's there, yep. right? Because in his mind, this represents um, a straying away from quote unquote God's values, which is again another dog whistle for conservative politics. Absolutely, so, you know. And then here we go. Oh, this must be God's judgment now because the demonic left, right, liberals yep. are trying to destroy the country. So this 100%. this rhetoric all plays into the stew that we're currently seeing. Yes, absolutely. And I like that you pointed out that Christians should be political, because I actually think the further that I've dove into my study of Christianity, right? Now, um, when I say this, I'm in year 16 of working towards ordination. I went right out the gate, got the most useless degree, and went with a pastoral ministry degree. And now I'm doubling down by going for a Master's of Arts in Religious Studies with an eye on a PhD in queer theology, right? Wow. Um, so, but... When I say, like, my faith has radicalized me, it has. It's made me actually radically love humanity. And yes. I can't support any political movement that does not first base itself on the validity uh, and beauty of humanity. Yeah. And so uh, it's so funny because the loudest religious voices right now, which are literally screaming with veins bulging from their neck because apparently there's no other way to preach are the ones that are actively devaluing people and that yes. to me is deeply anti-christ if you ask me oh, it's I, I, accurate e evangelicalism in america is an incredibly dehumanizing religion right now there's mm -hmm. just no way around it and the, you can tell because of how they vote and what they advocate for absolutely. i mean trump would not be in power if it wasn't for white evangelicals ben absolutely Shapiro, matt walsh candace owens Ali stuckey Charlie mm -hmm. Kirk, they would not have the platforms they have if yep. white evangelicals were not quite literally sometimes snorting up their nose. We have it's to be honest about literally. this. Yeah. You know, like, oh, we absolutely. have to be honest about this. Like, like I tell pastors whenever I engage them, please be aware that that Charlie Kirk is discipling your congregation more than you are. Like you absolutely. need to understand that. Yep. Um, and so, you know, so that, that's a big element here. And we can that starts really, really with talk radio, right? Mm -hmm. In the 80s, Rush Limbaugh, pioneers. Right. And I grew up. So full disclosure here, I, again, I grew up very fundamentalist. My dad was was a painter, mm -hmm. owned his own business. I was homeschooled. So mm -hmm. what are my field trips? I go to work with dad to, to roll, you know, ro roll, roll some walls. Yep. And my dad had, you know, Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, Mark Levin. I, I can recite to you the lineup. So I grew up on a very steady diet. Um, Glenn Beck, you name it. I, I listened to them, Same. you know, consistently. Yep. OK. And and so we have to understand how how they were really brilliant opportunists to start mm -hmm. using Christian language to push, uh, at one point, I would say maybe just conservative views, but then it's quickly morphed into far right. And then with yes. Trump, I would argue fascist views. Yes. Um, and, and I think we're really seeing that. So again, we have to, I, I believe personally that, that, that um, 
evangelicals and other people are not criticizing or bringing attention enough to the powerful influence of Tucker Carlson, of Charlie Kirk. I mean, these are the people who influence how yep. evangelicals even see the Bible in a lot of ways. Yep. And so that is incredibly scary to see oh how this is God. happening. It's terrifying. I mean, Ben Shapiro picked up one of my TikToks this past year, which also I feel like is some so sort sorry. of some sort of something, but it was great because he was actually dead ass wrong. And I literally phoned a rabbi to prove it. Um, but, <laughs> um, but, you know, these are the people that are informing our pastors and our congregations. And we've also like something insidious that Trump did, particularly, which was he told he told people that they're going to lie to you. They're going to try to steal this election. They're going to tell you this, that and the other. And people gobbled okay. it up. And so now you have like a really honestly, um, what I like to call like McDonald's theology or prefab theology, right? Like American evangelicalism as it stands, particularly white evangelicalism, because I know a lot of black evangelicals that don't share these same. No, no. Right. But no, no. I like to call like white American Christianity slash, uh, you know, Christian nationalism. It's, it's like a McDonald's faith, right? We have prefab oh, no. buildings. We have prefab bulletin <laughs> inserts. We have prefab, you know, communion wafers. We have prefab theology. We're not yeah. Actually thinking about it. And if you listen to half of what these usually white, straight, cis male pastors are saying, um, it's it doesn't actually exegetically check out. You can't trace no. it. The, the apology industry is a joke. I'm sorry. Like yep. I have so little respect for some of these people because their arguments are not honest. And I'm not saying right. listen, I'm not saying that that they're bad people. Right. Okay, but like they have a job to do protect white evangelical theology by yes. calling it Christianity and not acknowledging that it comes from someplace, right? Exactly. I mean, if that's maybe one of the most insidious things that I realized was yep. like, oh wait, I was never taught that. Like, you know, I was taught, okay, you have black theology, maybe mm -hmm. oriental theology, they just have theology. Right. Just theology. Right. It's, it's not theology. white. It's just, it's just, it's the right theology, you know? Exactly. Oh, well, James Cone, he's a black liberation theology. That's a false gospel. But hey, you know, John MacArthur, he's just preaching the word straight the up. Word. No bias, right? No bias so, whatsoever. Right. And so that's probably one of the most, for me, insidious parts about that whole crowd is that they have done a brilliant, it's effective, a it brilliant is. job of convincing the average white evangelical that they are giving them just God's straight up truth. No yep. interpretation there, yep. or, or if they are interpreting it, it's correct. It's right? correct. And, and there's no other way to see these passages. The Bible is clear. And, oh my God, and, yeah. and so we have to understand like how theology, it's hard for me to know what feeds what the most. Okay. But they definitely feed each other. They oh. absolutely feed each other. And, 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 and Trump is Trump was brilliant because he courted the, the charismatic vote for the first time. Yes. Right? He did. So like George Bush was not going to Bethel or going to Paula nope. white and saying like, Hey, Paula, you know, nope. but Trump knew because, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I'm, I'm very big on not dehumanizing and, and I, I don't want to speak ill of an entire people group, but mm -hmm. generally speaking, I found my run in, in charismatic, more Pentecostal circles with people who are just more easily apt to believe, oh, it's supernatural. Oh, God is going to move, right? Yep. Oh, God gave someone a word of prophecy and I will believe it until it actually comes true. Whether yep. it does or doesn't, doesn't matter. I just have to keep waiting for the blessing, right? Oh, absolutely. So Trump was brilliant in, in, in courting those kinds of leaders to yep. give prophecies and you know talk about how he's a new Cyrus, et cetera, that yep. really emboldened that evangelical vote. Oh, we have se we have several of them in my town. Like, did did no one else read when it said like a word of prophecy isn't well? Okay, okay, let's read. Well, let's pause. But speaking in tongues is only valid if there's someone else who's independent to interpret it, right? So that's a whole conversation we can have. Right. But also the the original definition of the word prophet, if you actually go back to the Hebrew, um, a prophet is someone who spoke truth to power in their day. They weren't some sort of fortune teller right. what's that well, god <laughs> is that, you know no, they looked at what was happening in the day they lined it up to the hebrew scriptures and they said this is bullshit you know what i mean right, right, but, right. but 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 in terms of profit right like we've got i i subscribe because i'm a masochist i subscribe to mark driscoll's daily emotional uh daily devotional things and so we've got masochist. Th i am so we've got things in here right and he's speaking from a position of authority but he's he's also proved to be like actually a complete pathological liar side note uh, but he's he's speaking from a position of authority that passive men harm their families in genesis there was 
a wedding and then there was a war. Adam and Eve are attack and that was the beginning of God's or that was the beginning of Satan's attack on the family. And then, you know, the ever the ever so important thing that we find in every church lectionary ever, meaning we'd never find it except for evangelicals, is yeah. how the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is absolutely about LGBTQ people. It's so right. important to realize, like I interviewed Dr. Will Gaffney a couple months ago and she pointed out that um, 70 to 80 percent of the church global uses the church calendar and uses the book of common prayer and the church lectionary wow. which wow. means that 70 to 80 percent of the church aka the mainline denominations are all following this rhythm and pattern but yeah, then we've yeah. got these people like mark driscoll like jerry falwell yeah, like that's right even that's right. billy graham you know all these people popping off and just preaching whatever the spirit leads there's yeah. no genuine connection to church history there it's actually yes. a political think piece but it's sold as this is biblical Christianity. That's why it's so dangerous. Really, um, you brought up a really important point that I think, again, goes under the radar. And yeah. that is the, what I call bumper sticker Christianity. Mm. Okay. Um, and, and like you said, okay, so I, I'm going to go a little more conservative for a minute, but bear with me. There right. is a, a really powerful book called Unchristian by the Barna Group. Okay. The Barna Group is a massive research firm. They write, they, they do, they're like, they're known for their research. They're well-trusted. They're kind of like Pew Research, but like for okay. Christian thinking. Okay. And I remember reading their book when I was like, I don't know, 20. It was, it was a while ago. I'm, I'm, I'm in like my, my Paul Washer phase, right? Mm -hmm. The gospel truth. And they point out though, how according to their data, 75% of Americans claim to have made a, a, a profession of faith, okay, at one time in their life that still means something to them today. Wow, mm -hmm. that's like three out of four Americans. Right. But right. when they when they asked those same people if they had a biblical worldview, and to be fair, they it was very generic, you know, yep. God's real, Satan didn't exist that you know that i mean like anyone in any kind of christian circle anywhere would probably affirm it yeah they they had six percent that said yes and that always stuck out to me because it, it reminded me of like the church has been the evangelical church i should say mm -hmm. has been so effective in like their in like their capitalist industrial machine of mm -hmm. getting people to feel a certain way during an event and to walk down an aisle, which also is a very recent invention in church history, uh, you know, and sign off on a card and say, yes, I, I profess Jesus mm -hmm. while having absolutely no legitimate, um, even education on what the hell they just signed up for. Right. Yeah. And so we, that also plays a role in this because when you have people who are uneducated or and i would argue you know if i had the choice of the catholic way or protestant way i'd still take being able to read the bible on my own however uh -huh. i un i understand why the catholic tradition says i don't know this can yeah. be kind of dangerous just giving anyone a bible to interpret right, right? so when, when you combine those two things and then you have very persuasive communicators to push why the bible supports christian nationalism you really have a recipe for disaster Absolutely. right um, and so here we are. I mean, again, there are so we could be here for hours unpacking every layer, every ingredient yeah. that goes yeah. into that cake. But those are some big pieces that we just don't focus on enough yeah. that I think really end up hurting us. And it's one of the reasons why 80% of white evangelicals vote for Trump. And it's also why a lot of them were big QAnon conspiracy, <laughs> conspiracy theorists. It's a reason why white evangelicals are the least likely to get vaxxed during a pandemic. It's yeah. a reason why Sean Foyt, the worship leader, is, is able to make a lot of money doing yeah. these maskless hands off our children QAnon bullshit rallies because yeah. the, the the Christian base that he feeds is susceptible to just believing anything that a leader says. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I brand. Think, oh yeah, no no no. I think I think that's exactly it and it, it feeds into it feeds into accepting anything that a political leader is telling you because all of a sudden, if they if they hold up a Bible, albeit upside down in front of a church. <laughs> Two <laughs> Corinthians. <laughs> <laughs> if they hold up a Bible, right, then they are God's messenger to humanity. Never mind that they're literally raping underage girls, right? Totally. Never mind, right? And and this is the this is the marriage we have. I mean, we have pastors who are also simultaneously cops standing up and saying, "I love the badge and I love my job, and anyone who believes right. in Black Lives Matter is evil." Well, you are responsible for the lowest common denominator of person who hears your words. That's something I take very seriously as someone who has always felt a call to be pastoral and someone who people want to listen to, right? 
I know that no matter what I say, it's going to seep out and it's going to seep down. And so when you when you say things like that, they are dangerous. And you are responsible for the actions that happen. And that's exactly how Christian nationalism links to white supremacy and hate crimes. Can I level with you, Leo? Yeah, level. I take my faith incredibly seriously. Mm -hmm. I love the Bible. Mm -hmm. I love scripture. I love mm -hmm. learning about the nuance and the tradition that is the, the, the Christian house, as I call it, right? Mm -hmm. And people in a lot of these people in these Christian nationalist circles, they do not. I find what they do so disrespectful yes. to what is a beautiful faith. Now, obviously, anytime in history, we can look back and see how the Bible has been used as a tool of oppression or a tool mm -hmm. of liberation, right? So certainly, certainly these are powerful things, but yep. to see um, a group weaponize the Bible that really keeps the, the, the dominant group at the top while, while marginalizing already marginalized groups. Mm -hmm. I, the reason why I get so infuriated, the reason why I do what I do, the reason why I have reels where I'm screaming sometimes, right? Is because it's like, how dare you Yes. How dare you take the, the sacred scriptures? How mm -hmm. dare you, you know, apply such horrible, um, uh, su su such a dangerous framework to horrible the Bible? Horrible hermeneutics, yeah, horrible. Yeah, and, and, then, and then sell it as the only way to be Christian. Yep. How yep. dare you? So that, yes. I mean, I take this stuff seriously, right? This yeah. is, I think, I think one of the critiques that, I'm sure you hear too. Oh, liberals don't take the Bible seriously. They don't take sin seriously. Yep. Are you goddamn kidding me? Like this, this is my repentance for crying out loud. Like, exactly. I take sin seriously, right? Yeah. But, yep. but, but do, do I, do I take your hyper literalist, no context, fundamentalist, the Bible said it, God says it version of sin seriously? No, because you know what? It's a weapon to oppress people and exactly. honestly kill people. Exactly. So much of what we are taught is a giant think piece. I mean, <laughs> I can't even like a lot of weird stuff happens when people, you know, really, really interpret the Bible and say what it's supposed to say. Right. I mean, uh, when the Bible was first translated into English, they burned the guy at the stake for it. That's what happened to John Wycliffe. They're like, nope, you did, you were too willy nilly with it. Yet we got people out here that are like comfortable saying that this is what the Bible says and there's no need for interpretation. And you know, it doesn't matter the context it was written in and it's an inerrant, but notice they're all men who are still walking around without their eyes plucked out. So really, what are we a literalist about? We're a literalist about the foreigner. We're a literalist about abortion. We're a literalist about queer people. Guess what those are? Those are also boilerplate political stump speeches. Totally. The Bible. You're on the money. You're that's not the Bible. And that's where it converges into Christian nationalism. And that's why it's dangerous. I have a professor yes, whose yes. name is Dr. Rachel Mikva, um, and she is uh, she's a rabbi. And um, she wrote a book called Dangerous Religious Ideas, The Deep Roots of a Self-Critical Faith. And it's written from, from uh, she's a rabbi, right? And she works heavily in an intercultural space. So it's written to all of like about all the Abrahamic faiths, right? Islam, oh, Judaism, I love that. Christianity. And it talks about how there is actually deep roots of self-criticalness that are built into any genuine practice of oh, Abrahamic religions, because you are always wielding the power of God when you speak right. about religion, always. Exactly. And you cannot be an effective religious leader if you are not open to conversation, if you are not deeply committed to the Bible and to it, the comprehensive study of its history and its interpretation, and you sure as shit cannot be of God if you cannot take criticism period. I agree. I mean, so let me ask you this. I mean, do you, is there any other questions about Christian nationalism you want to hit? Cause I feel like we're kind of going into theological territory, which I'm fine riffing off of too. Oh yeah. I no, sure, no. I want to make, sure, make sure that I've answered any questions you might want to have for the listeners before we kind of go there. Yeah, no, like talk to me about, so we're, so we're still having this hypothetical conversation with someone who is in the world of evangelicalism, but maybe is sure, open sure. to hearing where we've come. Talk yeah, to yeah. me since we did dive into it, like, uh, since I took us, I'm a theologian, like kind of by nature. So I go there. Um, How about it. But talk to me about the ways in which you have come to see like the faith that you were taught or the faith that you see displayed actually, actually contradicts um, theology as you learn and grow and study it. Well, I mean, you know, one of the biggest things for me personally, again, I want to just emphasize, like you said, I mean, I was 
all in. And even when I started New Evangelicals, I was still serving in an evangelical church faithfully. The church okay. asked me to leave uh, the worship ministry I was a part of due to this work. So I, okay. I was very much of the persuasion of, hey, you know, I, I have a good evangelical church. That, you know, there's room to grow here. Right. So I want, I, want, I, want, I want people to hear me. I did not go in saying, fuck you, I'm out of here. That was never right. the intent. I mean, honestly, right? right? Right. That's kind of the perception some people get. So one of the big things for me that really started getting me to wake up theologically, um, I'm not sure if you know who the Bible Project is, Tim Mackey, yeah. John Collins. I personally, for me, I discovered them at such a pivotal time. They really saved my faith of like, wait, I mean, there's so much more happening here in Genesis yeah. in, you know, in, in, in this way and that way. So they're, they're a key part of that. But as I began to listen to, I mean, people who are immersed, right? immersed in the Hebrew, immersed in the Jewish tradition, mm. immersed in the scriptures as theologians and scholars of theology. Listening to so many of them is what really started shaping me because I realized that God bless the pastors that I've come to know, but they're just not equipped. They're trained by evangelical systems to oh. maintain evangelicalism, right? <sighs> not to really explore the Bible on its own terms. Now, I'm not saying that even us do that well, but right. we can at least acknowledge, right, that, hey, the Bible is not a modern book. Correct. The Bible is its own thing, Correct. And, 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 and it's not about us reading it. It's more about, 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 about it reading us in a lot of ways, right? Oh, 100%. 100%. And, and, so, and so the big, so that, that, that's the framework I'm operating in. Now, the moment for me that was like, whoa, I never thought about this, was I was reading Scott uh, McKnight's book, The Blue Parakeet. Scott mm -hmm. McKnight also wrote the book, A Church Called Tove. He's a very accessible theologian for a lot of your listeners out there, right? Mm -hmm. Very well written. And he mm -hmm. talks about how even in the scriptures, God, this God character, Yahweh, you know, Elohim, uh, not Elohim, uh, uh, Yahweh, um, um, or Adonai, the way that, 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 that this God figure engages people looks different depending on what part of the book you're reading. Right. Yes. So, so God works with the Israelites in Exodus and Leviticus and gives them the, the, the law, the, the law, really the, the teaching, but the law, right? right. You know, and gives them the Torah and then how, how Jesus interacts right? is very different than that. And then the Holy Spirit looks different than that. And you yep. see, even in the Bible, I don't want to use the term progression to, to trigger the thought of progressive Christianity. It's not what I'm saying, right. but right. you see a direction mm -hmm. that even the Bible itself is pointing out. I mean, think about it like this for your listeners out there. Maybe you're someone who's like, I don't see it. Here's one easy example. Think about how circumcision got flipped on its head by Paul, right? Here's Paul, this former fundamentalist, um, mm -hmm. You know, maybe a Jewish scholar, we can say, right? Yeah. Uh, really in it, loves the Torah, is immersed in it. And he goes and says, you know, the circumcision thing, based on how I'm reading things now and in, in, in light of how I experienced Christ on the road to Damascus, so to speak, right? Uh, based on all that, I think that some of these, these verses, for lack of a better term, some, some, some of these scrolls might not be pointing just to a physical circumcision, but maybe one of the heart. Maybe yeah. it's more internal, right? And then what happens? There's a huge debate. They have yeah. these councils and they're going back and forth. And eventually the, 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 the main group says, yes, we agree with that. And now mm -hmm. that you have to understand, and you know better than I do, Leo, that is a big fucking deal, right? Massive. I mean, that is, I mean, that is Abram, Abraham. Yep. That's how this started with yep. circumcision. So yep. even the Bible itself gives examples of how things and how God interacts, depending on the cultural moment and how mm -hmm. he interacts with his people. Um, it, it, it changes even in the Bible. And when I, when I realized that I went, this is way different than yeah. how I was taught to encounter the Bible. This is ah. way different than how I was taught to read the Bible. So if, if I was so misunderstood or misaligned there, what else am I missing? And from there, you know, the flood gets broken. Absolutely. I mean, so my first degree, which um, I, you know, I would just studied pastoral ministry, theology, public speaking, and straight the Bible. Like I have a Bible concentration, right? Um, yeah. I mean, but my systematic theology textbook was written by someone who was a Trump supporter, Wayne Grudem, right? I mean, take I was gonna out say, was it Wayne Grudem? It was the Wayne father Grudem, of complementarianism. Oh, <laughs> right? the yeah. Way. And then yeah. I come come to find out after that the church yeeted me, right? Because the church was like, yeah, no, you got to get out. And I was like, well, why? You know, um, right. but come to find out, I start reading and I realized that that's all basically a giant think piece, 
right? That is not, I mean, he, Wayne Grudem is writing from a specific standpoint. Now, fl fast forward to this year when I'm studying from a black theologian who is also a Buddhist, who also works in interfaith space, who also is a liberation theologian. And I'm seeing all of this from a different perspective. And I'm realizing, yo, there's so much more here. And if I could say one thing, like I have a specific friend in mind who I'll probably share this podcast with, who I believe at their core is a great person but they belong to a community that's caused a lot of harm, um, a, a faith community that's caused a lot of harm in our community. And part of this larger evangelical perspective, I don't think that the evangelical churches are comprised of bad people. But I think the second you start thinking on your own, and the, start, the second you start extending that goodness that you have to people who are deemed other than the church, I think your church will very carefully yeet you like they yeeted me. I right was here. the I, I too was the golden child. I had my own Bible study. Um, I led worship on campus. I was on sports teams. I was a floor, floor leader and I was removed from everything as soon as I came out. And I hadn't even really transitioned to a progressive approach to theology at that point. I had just come out, you know? Right, uh, right. It's just wild. Well, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. I apologize. No, that, that was my just musing. You're good. <laughs> I was going to say that I wasn't even queer affirming when yeah. I started New Evangelicals. I, my persuasion at the moment was, well, despite our theological differences, they should be included in our worship and, and part of serving. They, they should be treated equally, more of like a press and sprinkle approach, I guess. Right. I wasn't even like, hey, it's not sinful. You know, it's right. no big deal. And even right. that was too much for my church that I was a part of for six years all in volunteering giving everything so i know that feeling it's horrible and that's the moment right where you go wait i thought our beliefs and values are kind of aligned and but clearly they're not right like, like, like clearly you're going to center the the right belief over the relationship no matter yeah. how much i, I would have tried to invert that right yep. it, it wasn't a thing yeah and i and the crazy thing is is like i'm not stubborn enough to risk all of that I am not stubborn enough to just willy nilly like, boo, I'm hearing queer. I've never thought about it. You know what I mean? Oh. Um, I take the Bible seriously enough that I spent like five years agonizing over this. Like what at the time wasn't even an action. It was just an inkling <laughs> that yeah. I might be gay. You know what I mean? Right. Just a thought. Like, right. Just, just yeah. a thought, right? And <laughs> here, here I am, here I am, you know, 12 years after coming out and I'm like, holy crap, you know, this thing that was so formative in my life has run so far of the, the off the theological course it has run so far off the political course and it's run so far off even a moral course totally. right all of these things totally. and now it's I mean, weaponized in the it's weaponized in the voting booths and it's weaponized in the pulpit and it's weaponized in the public sphere I say it all the time. How do evangelicals want us to take them seriously when they're when they're so morally depraved in so many ways? I mean, yes. and I don't. I mean that sincerely. You know, yes. like I don't understand how you can hide abuse. I mean, we're recording this in the end of May, right? Yep. The SBC report just dropped. I mean, they're they're Mark Driscoll still platformed in these spaces, yep. even though he, he had an entire podcast unpack all of his abuse. Yep. So how do we expect? How do they expect us to take them seriously when they're telling us that morals matter, sexuality matters, when yes. it's such a double standard for these leaders and institutions? Absolutely. We, I, that, you know, that's why I'm so, that's part of why I think a lot of us have this deconstruction explosion happening because we're like, how you, are you like, are you gaslighting me? Like, is that the only way for me to move forward? Is by yep. believing that I'm just not seeing what's obviously happening in your silence. Meanwhile, yep. you're telling me that, that, that the quote unquote queer agenda is trying to destroy America. Like yep. I have queer friends. They are yep. some of the, they are the most uh, 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 loving, kind yep. people I've met, you know, yeah, who like, rights for everyone. <laughs> honestly, I'm basic as fuck. I'm just like, ah, oh, I like, I don't know. Just love people and stuff like feed wait, them. Wait, Leo, Leo, you're telling me that you're not part of some underground cabal, you know, trying to overthrow American values and usher in your radical queer yeah. agenda. Yeah, that's the whole agenda. I made a TikTok and it was the shortest one I made. And I was like, here's the queer agenda. <laughs> Fucking live. That's it. <laughs> right. right. Well, oh my God. Okay. I don't want to rant too much, but again, like think about, about how the evangelical community has, has treated the queer community yeah. over the couple of decades. I mean, yeah. I, I think it's Bridget Eileen Rivera who wrote the book. Um, uh, do I have it here? Uh, yeah, no, I don't have it. Anyway, she, she wrote a great book. Um, 
um, uh, heavy burdens. And mm-hmm. Bridget Eileen Rivera is someone who believes she uh, she is a celibate uh, queer folk in, okay. a, in a non-romantic relationship by okay. choice, but yep. she believes that obviously anyone should have the choice to live how, how they want. That's kind of her mm-hmm. position. Mm-hmm. In her book, she documents how statistically speaking, if you are queer and go to a church, you are at a higher risk of self-harm or suicide than any other people group, right? And it's like, when you read that and you start reading the stories that she talks about, about the AIDS crisis and how evangelicals gave no support, how the tropes were, were, were everywhere, you go, wait, I was on the wrong side of this. Mm-hmm. I was on the wrong side of this issue, yeah. right? I was, I was on the wrong side of the tracks here. And I yeah. participated in the dehumanization of people made in God's image, just trying to fucking live. But yeah. I let the far right conservative machine make the, this group of people, um, it made them to be monsters. I hate to yeah. use that term, but like yeah. the way that they dehumanized the queer community and would find the most extreme examples of anything to prove that therefore everyone is like this, right? Yeah. Which you can do in any group, obviously. Of course. It's, just, it's, it's so not good faith, but they yeah. influence the evangelicals. And that's absolutely, I'm absolutely. And then, and then like, I'm not trying to pull the conversation any one way. I think these are parallel and converging conversations when you talk about how the evangelical movement right this precip when i say evangelical i also should offer the caveat that like i said i know a lot of black evangelicals that don't suck right (laughs) Um, i have some of them on my on my uh podcast previously that i've you know been in faith communities with i have some coming on in the future um but like i'm speaking a lot of this same brand of faith that we would call christian nationalism today and and these these ideas that are they're so opposite right jesus was a brown socialist who was killed by the empire like i don't know how much more specific we can get but if you really dig into historical critical context of the bible like jesus was a brown socialist right he's speaking truth to power right right even even his own community thought that oh whole rule with power Mm -hmm. and he didn't right like i mean you're at you're 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 right on the money with that and it it, like you said you these things intersect that's another word that we can't talk about right again they like like far i mean i'm gonna say far right right wing um, pundits and politicians really hijack these words but these things absolutely intersect they absolutely do and 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 when you really boil it down i have found in my studies and in my experience that what it comes down to is freedom for me and not for thee. That's what it comes. I mean, I'll give you one example of this. So uh, for new evangelicals, we're really big on having good faith dialogue wherever we can. Mm -hmm. I interviewed on my own podcast, a man named Samuel Duth. He is the pastor or one of the pastors over at Awaken Church San Diego, which is honestly at this point, that shit off the rails. Okay. They are, I'm not kidding you. Tucker Carlson yeah. has spoken there. Charlie oh, Kirk God. has spoken there. They're advocating for certain politicians from the pulpit, like, vi- like clearly violating their 501c3 agreement. Um, and they are far Christian nationalists. I mean, that yeah. they are, it's crazy. Some of the stuff, some of the stuff that they've been pushing. However, a couple of years ago, I had him on mm-hmm. and I asked him because he would he kept on saying freedom. I said, well, freedom for who? And mm-hmm. I got him to a point, I was super nice about it, but I got him to a point where he had to admit like, yeah, when I say freedom, I don't mean like queer people. I mean like more freedom for me pretty much. You know, cause I said, well, I said, I told him that I said, Samuel, when you say freedom for everyone, do you mean the queer community? Like, 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 like do you support queer rights? And he couldn't, I'm like, exactly. That's the whole point, right? Like what you're advocating for is, oh, more of my rights. You're already the most privileged group. Evangelicals mm-hmm. run America in so many ways. Okay. Mm-hmm. There are, obviously there are other groups too, but they're one of the, they're one of the big ones, especially how, mm-hmm. how they vote and how well funded they are. Oh yeah. They, they they win at the Supreme Court. They have Christians have immense, perhaps they're the most privileged Christians to ever walk the face of the planet yep. ever. Right. Yep. And it's still not enough. They yep. can't even advocate for someone who doesn't maybe believe or maybe does in your case, right? Believes yep. in the same risen Jesus as they do. Yep. Right. You they can't even give someone like you the same legal rights. Yep. How disparaging is that? What they can. it's disparaging. It, 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 it it's abhorrent to me. And that's why I left. <laughs> It's insanity. It's insanity to me. I don't, I don't understand it. So I have to actually head out to speak at a city council meeting in my town where our super white mayor, um, our super white mayor who literally can't acknowledge that racism exists, posted a post about the Buffalo shooting and said, the hate has to stop after he 
disbanded our diversity and equity committee because <sighs> the black people on our committee called him out on saying something racist. So I have to go handle this situation, if you will. <laughs> but if you can wrap us up, if you could say one thing to someone who is listening to this, who might genuinely be curious about like, why do, why are people conflating the church I go to with Christian nationalism and hate, and they might be on the fence. Like, what would you say yeah. to them? What would the you Christian, say to 20-year-old you? Yeah, the Christian faith is massive. Explore it. Like, explore it. You know, look into the other rooms. You don't have to agree with them, but understand that that that, that the particular thread you're in is is really, a, I would argue now, a fringe thread, yeah. right, that is not reciprocated by the majority of Christians, whether they're Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, even mainline Protestant. So yep. please, if, you're, if you take your faith seriously, go from, is it right or wrong, to explore. Just yep. explore the different perspectives out there. Yep. That, I think that, that, that will be a great, pers- a great place to start. That's I like that. I like that a lot. And if, if, you're, if you're listening and you want to, in good faith, engage this dialogue, hit up myself or Tim. Um, Tim's page is super fantastic. I'm going to let him plug it in a moment. But <laughs> we can provide you with, with books that we've read um, that have shaped us. And they're by people who are as equally as serious about their faith as anyone you can think of in your circle, maybe more even. Because uh, a lot of the people that I read, it costs them a lot more to get to a point where they have the credibility to speak out yeah. than any of us could ever imagine so totally. well um so tim go ahead and plug this is your chance to let everybody know how to follow you how to get involved give yourself a quick sure. commercial yeah you can find us on at the new evangelicals on instagram or tiktok or the new evangelicals on twitter I mean, we're pretty much anywhere where it says the new evangelicals that's pretty much us at this point including our podcast um and my dms are open i i live in the dms always um welcome to engage me um, i will absolutely do it on good faith no problem at all Fantastic. We love to see it. Well, friends, thank you so much for joining us. I really hope that you get a chance to like and share and comment on this video and podcast. I think it's a really important conversation that needs to be had because we need to speak frankly about the ways in which Christian nationalism has gone awry. Um, And we need to speak to the people who might genuinely be um, on the fence or sympathetic because we are actually at a point where we need a moral reckoning for our country and it goes beyond politics and it goes beyond faith, but we need to do better to protect and support marginalized people and to build a, to build us into the aspiration of what America could be. And we're not going to get there if we keep silo, keep siloed views from extremists in our, in our pulpits and in our hearts. So please listen, please share, please comment, and please tune in next time to Conversations Official. Tim, it was a pleasure. We'll see you later, everybody. See ya. Thanks. Bye. This has been the Conversations Podcast. Thank you so much for joining. If you have any questions or comments or just want to get involved, feel free to join the conversation on social media. You can find us at Conversations Official on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And please don't forget to rate, follow, and share this podcast. We're available on Anchor, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for joining the conversation.